You're watching Drake Wing Gaming. Enjoy the video. Hey guys and gals, Nary here from Drake Wing Gaming. It's something to me on Twitter, the Gaming Dragon. Today I'm coming back at you another Let's Play episode of Minotaur Hotel. So yeah, before we jump into it, just wanted to let y'all know that our Patreon is now for as little as $5. Y'all can help support the channel, get some awesome rewards like permanent access to our community Discord server, and full access to upcoming Not Safe for Work videos. Anyway, let's go ahead and jump right back in. Alarm chain, you were up, and let's go. All right. Swaying wind, he could hear it again now alongside the rustling leaves. He propped his chest up, supporting himself on his burning forearms, and taste came back to him. Iron. He coughed and cold, dark blood poured out of his mouth. It fell on the white fur of his hand. His tongue remained coated in the black oil. It was bitter, tasting like a forge's fume smelled. He knew the scent well. As he tried to gather himself, the blood dripped down to the soil. His fur remained matted with red while the dark oil dripped down. Cursed blood, he thought. But something else came to mind as well. The chill that brought him back. It was under his tongue. A hard, icy lump. He tried to spit it out to no avail. His insides lurched and he lost control. He retched, but nothing would come out. It was another hour before he managed to stand up and see the horizon. There was no sky above. Only sharp-edged rocks pointing down like knives. The horizon itself was painted with serpentine rivers their waters crashing around and leaving foamy trails. The land was dark, and yet light seemed to seep from all surfaces. The ceiling stalactites shone with turquoise. The field of flowers blinked with white lights when the breeze, flew, when the breeze blew by. The soil itself shone with a subdued, almost royal purple, and the breeze had a freshness to it. The river's crashing waters filled the air with little droplets. Water dripped down here and there from the ceiling, with an almost lazy grace, like a god slipping gifts to the people below from above. A man waited by the river shore, looking up to the Minotaur. He beckoned, and right there Asterion's mind was set at ease. This beautiful land was his mercy. The knot in his throat and a lump under his tongue would be the final pains he'd ever feel. He had been freed. Chapter 5 Soft Opening You wake up to the sound of Asterion's hooves clicking on the wooden floor right behind you. Good morning, Master. I am sorry for the noise. It was not my intention to wake you up. Snuggled up on the couch with a blanket covering you, it's easy to ignore the Minotaur's words. Were it not for the sunlight shining directly on your eyes and the smell of breakfast, you would have fallen back asleep. You pee yourself away from your blanket's warmth. You give Asterion a dopey smile as you step up, and neatly fold the blanket before leaving it on the couch. I slept very well. Thank you, Asterion. Oh, that is a relief. Well, I went ahead and made breakfast for you. At times, it is easy to forget how exceptional are the circumstances you find yourself in. Waiting for breakfast is such a mundane thing, but all it takes is a glimpse of Asterion for the facade of normalcy to fall. It is easy to find Asterion's quick healing, jar quick healing jarring, more so than the hotel itself. He already stretches the clothes that seemed too big yesterday. I see the shirt fits you better. Do you like it? Yes, I very much appreciate the gesture, Master. There wasn't much left in my wardrobe, save for my old clothes from when John Marie was my master in an old Perizo Perizoma. Perizoma? I must have slipped. I'm sorry. It's an old style of loincloth. It's what we wore back in Greece. No need to be embarrassed. I'm glad you like the shirt enough to wear it again. Perhaps it is fitting that I have more modern clothes to wear. Today might be a special day. Now that the hearth is lit, guests may find their way to the hotel again. I want to make a good impression. Maybe the clothes I picked are inappropriate. I wouldn't know. It has been a long time, after all. Something about the way you conduct yourself, Master. You strike me as quite secure in your attitude and decision-making. A firm person. I'm inclined to believe your judgment for what is appropriate must be reliable. What should I...
Wow, that's a cool structure. Holy shit. Oh, I guess that's Luke. An all-American griffin. What the hell? Of course. The griffin sits on a damp picnic table, sipping his stale, diluted all-American beer. <laughs> He hunches forward, supporting his elbows on his knees, and inhales the petrichor wafting from the rain-slick soil. He enjoys every gulp of his lukewarm bud light, letting it sit in his beak until all the taste is gone before swallowing. He looks ahead, towards Cape Canaveral's launch site, to avoid staring at the families nearby. He tells himself to smile. The table is coated in a fine layer of salty water, blowing onto the mainland from the sea up ahead. That same salty condensation coats the griffin's feathers, fur, and beak. His mind hops with each languid blink of his eyes, the lukewarm beer with an aluminum aftertaste. Petrigore smell mixed in with grass from the rain. The humming of insects. Y'all can. Check out the song Petrichor by Sulfur. Petrichor by Sulfur. By, um... The song, the song is called Petrichor by Sulfur. And it's, uh, by Soil Work. It's an excellent song. A catchy pop song blaring from a stereo a few yards away. He taps his feet to the song's rhythm while laying a hand over the front pocket where he keeps his passport. The setting sun glaring at him, he raises a hand to shield his eyes and looks at the fine, wa fine, fine men hanging around with their families, dancing to the song. He knows he shouldn't. They're married, after all, but the griffin can't stop himself from fantasizing. They're stout and hairy and damp from a humid day under the Florida sun. Their shirts have sweat stains. A few of them are wearing tank tops that ride up their bellies, showing off their treasure trails and navels. One of them in particular, a man in his mid-thirties wearing khaki knee-high shorts and an unbuttoned dress shirt adorned with the NASA logo, makes the griffin thirsty. He's grateful for his shades, it's easy to turn your head away while keeping your eyes drilled on the prize. One would guess he's enjoying the pink and oranges of the setting sun. There's no containing a longing like his. It's a fine man, sure, but it's the shirt that sells it for the griffin. Surely he's just some gift shop memento, but maybe he's an engineer on his day off. He's always had a thing for smart men like that. What he wouldn't do to taste him, feel him, hear him gush over his latest project. The griffin opens another beer and chugs it. Even with his eyes closed, he lays a hand on the table and recognizes all the carvings on it dating from decades ago. At times, this, at times this griffin avoids thinking in words. There's a danger in eloquence. Alright, y'all, I'm gonna go ahead and pause it right there for a second while I get some water. Be right back, y'all. He can't escape them forever. He checks his phone and scrolls over the messages from his ma and siblings, telling him they wouldn't be able to attend this year. The griffin sits on his picnic table, caressing the carving he left over the years and is assaulted by words. He calls himself Luke. Today he is alone with his own thoughts, and nothing is more terrifying. It's the first time only one of them came over to watch the launch. For decades now, the tradition was fulfilled without interruption. A yearly visit to Cape Canaveral to watch a launch. He knows that traditions are powerful, for as long as they remain unbroken. But he's here, and hopefully that will be enough to keep it going. Next year, he'll drag everyone along, even if it's the last thing he'll do. Even if, like today, the launch is canceled at the last minute, Truth is, seeing the rocket go up is a happy surprise. But it's not at all a necessary part of their tradition. What matters is bringing the family together to remember. Griffin opens another beer can. He'll keep drinking well into the night, at times sneaking sideways glances at all those fine, married, straight men, hoping one of them looks back with the same lecherous eyes. If they looked his way, they'd see a painfully average human, an American with hazel hair and somewhat tanned skin. Luke pats his, pa Luke pats his passport once more. How fragile is the illusion that keeps people from seeing his true form? A simple booklet is his main shield against detection. That same little notebook is what keeps all these men from looking at the griffin and noticing him. It makes him unnoticeable. If they to look his way, he'd be like a distant memory, a nondescript human shape their minds will glaze over. It is a weight all mythical creatures must carry, he knows. Luke thinks back to his childhood, surrounded by more than a dozen siblings, back at the old farmhouse to the east of Austin. During the summer, the entire family would sleep on the porch to cool off. The kids would become a mass of limbs piled together, breathing in unison. The boys in one corner, the girls in the other. Luke and his brothers would look up to the stars and trace constellations. Peter, the eldest, would tell the stories behind each one of them. Or make them up, as Luke realized years later that when he enlisted to the military and was mocked for thinking Orion was playing a guitar. Tonight, Luke cradles his memories, sleep cuddling his picnic table, looking up to the stars he'll never touch. When he speaks, he has the voice of a schoolboy, and he hears Peter, telling him all the made-up stories. One can almost forget the hardships and temptations of being an adult at such times. By the time dawn breaks, he will be a man again on his way home. Driving scares away the words. One's conscious and one's conscious mind turns off, and all that is left is being, is being in the moment. 
pure mechanical memory alongside the scent of his crack of his cracking leather seats. Long drives and thousands of miles never scared Luke. Ever since his twenty, ever since his twenties, ten hours on the road or more were always welcome. He has a home, a small cottage in the mountains of a flyover state, forty miles away from the nearest town. Not a single neighbor, human or otherwise. It wasn't worth it, making the effort to build bonds when he would just be forgotten. That was an effect of the passport and all the charms he used. It disguised the griffin as a human, but also made most people prone to forgetting him. He could never remain there for long. The isolation got to him, but neither did... Neither did he fare well in cities for long. Being forgotten was too much. The cabin was just a place he had the keys for. His car was a better his car was a better home, although with all the traveling over the years he had learned to not to grow too attached to any specific vehicle even when he took care of them like a son. Home was the road in all of its forms, usually car, but also train, bus, and even hitchhiking. As for a bed, his time in the military taught him that the floor is as good as any bed. Although sometimes he lay there at night wondering if he was in a bed instead, would there be someone beside him? He looks down to the cup holder to its right. There's his passport, that little blue booklet. His ball and chain. Like, you know, water time. Hmm. <laughs> oh, that's good water. He can't lie to himself. He can't stay long in one play in a single place. But he can't speak the truth either. Words he knows are dangerous. For a man such as him, these wordless moments of mechanical memory feel like the closest to paradise he will ever experience. Just do, be, don't think too hard about it. A reverie such as this can last days, but it is fragile. All it takes is a single unforeseen shift and it shatters. That's what happens. Far ahead, something catches Luke's eye. A man walking beside the road. He doesn't think. The impulse to help a stranger just hops up to the forefront of his mind. He wants to give him a ride. The car comes to a screeching halt. Luke lowers the passenger side's window and stretches over to greet the traveler. Oh, hello. <laughs> the griffin cranes his neck up and down to take a good look at the man, but speaks even before he's even seen his face. Hey, you. You want a ride? The griffin is still appraising the man, quite openly, in fact. It's been a few days since he sent any action. The last afternoon, Cape Canaveral only revved his boosters. Luke stares openly at the stranger's crotch. Now that's a happy surprise, he thinks. It's not every day a handsome hitchhiker packs his own lunch. A think length of venom-busting sausage. Now, aren't you a good Samaritan? Hmm, <laughs> don't mind if I do. Samaritan. Now, that's a word Luke hasn't heard before. He keeps his ignorance to himself. The traveler's a stiff accent with sharp consonants and a chirpy, youthful voice. As soon as he enters Luke's... As soon as he enters Luke's surprise... Luke's surprised with how well kempt he is. He smells like fresh laundry. That's an even better surprise. It's never sexy when the car ends up smelling like a garbage truck. The two set off together with the radio blaring a sweet jazz tune. Luke sneaks sideways glances at that fine piece of man, barely able to contain the throbbing need in his pants. Not many people nowadays give rides to just anyone they see on the road. That's very kind of you, Mr... Luke. Just Luke. What can I say? I don't have the heart to leave someone in the middle of nowhere. I travel a lot, you see. I a lot of hitchhiking, so I can always try to help out and pay it forward. By the way, mister, I'm afraid I didn't get your name either. John. John. That's what my friends call me. Oh. Interesting. Alright, y'all, I'm gonna go ahead and pause it right there. Is this a younger Jean? No, maybe not. Jean Murray. No, 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 that wouldn't be him, I don't think. He's from a different he's from a different time. Anyway, y'all, let's go ahead. I'm gonna go ahead and pause it right there. Thank y'all so much for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, ring that, not blah, ring that notification bell, and uh take a look at our Patreon if you can, it always helps. Anyway, I love you all. I'll see y'all in the next video. Bye-bye!